When you look at all the things you're doing, sleep, exercise, uh, antiparasitical stuff, the, 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 the monoclonal antibody, the diet, how would you rate those in relative importance to you? The monoclonal antibodies I'm saying is a kind of like a Band-Aid, which is just hold me over while everything else gets done. Because you know, being on a vegan diet for eight years and a trash panda and you know, nasty vegetarian diet, you know, for the five years before then, um, you know, so for the better part of two decades, I've been eating trash and there's a lot of damage that was done to my body. And so I'm having to go and reverse a lot of that. And I am, if MRI scans are to be believed, um, I am reversing that, but it is a long process because I have years and years of trauma that I've done to my body. I would say primarily the diet. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, happy Tuesday to you today. We have Kevin. Uh, Kevin Smith's going to be speaking about his uh, uh, journey in this uh, diet and health space. So Kevin, morning, Kevin. How are you today, man? Doing well and yourself, sir. I'm doing well. I just I just ran in. I had to drop my uh, girlfriend's car off at the dealership and was running back, so I just kind of swung in here. So I, was, I just kind of literally sprinted up here to get to this on time. So anyway, well, I you know obviously I've you know you've been a member of the Rivero community for for quite some time now. So I've, I've talked to you on many occasions, and uh, you know I think your story is 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 both uh, interesting but also very 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 inspiring, and so. I think it's something that I think a lot more people need to know about. And so this is uh, the time to do that. So Kevin, just if you don't mind, just kind of where are you located? A little bit of background about you and then we can get going. All right. So, yeah. So my name is Kevin Smith. I am located uh, deep in the piney woods of East Texas. I I'm closer to Louisiana than I am to Dallas. You're not too far from Lufkin, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? I'm going to college in Lufkin. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That, uh, was it, uh, not Nacogdoche. What's, what's, what's in there? Not Sam Houston state, the other one, Stephen F. Austin, right. And Angelina, Angelina college. Okay. That's right. Okay. I knew that's all around there. Okay. So Lufkin, Texas. So you have uh, multiple sclerosis and some other issues that, that you've been dealing with. I do indeed. Um, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis on my honeymoon back in 2011, uh, May of 2011. And, uh, and come to find out, I also had, uh, uh, had Lyme disease and, and through all the drama of, of dealing with all that, I developed uh, PTSD and bipolar and just got really messed up. How did you get, what made you investigate and get diagnosed with multiple sclerosis? What was going on? It did prompt you to say, hey, something's not right. And then how did that go? So I have been a juggler for my whole life. I mean, I, I, st I learned how to juggle when I was six. And, and most of my life, I had the, the vision of like, I was like lasered in on, I'm going to be a juggler. I'm going to perform as a juggler. I will teach as a juggler. And and so I did that for many years. I was working at the Renaissance festivals and then it got to the point where, you know, where I was going and trying to juggle and I would do, be doing a, a pattern that I knew and I had the muscle memory for having done this. And intellectually, I knew what I was doing, but my hands were not being coordinated in the same kind of way. And the, the nerve signal on one side was slowed down. So, yes, so my mother, my mother-in-law said, Hey, you need to go to the doctor. And the doctor did the tests and said, Hey, you, you need to go to the ER, the neurology division. And, and they went and, you know, took a MRI and a spinal tap and got my diagnosis. How old were you then? I was 27. Yeah. Wow. That's good. So I, yeah, that's pretty interesting juggling. I mean, no, no. I guess no, we're not two people are jugglers, so you would you'd be kind of interesting. But I, I guess I could see where that, that that would take. So how so what did they say on the MRI? What did they find? They found a bunch of lesions, uh, particularly on my cranium and uh 
my, or my cerebrum and some on my cervical and thoracic spine. And then they found uh, the proteins, you know, with the spinal tap, they went and they found the proteins down in my lumbar region yeah. uh, of the, the myelin sheath that had gone and been broken down and the residue. And, and what is your understanding of multiple sclerosis? If, if somebody were to ask you, what, what exactly is it? How do you describe that to people? So my, so my, my physical experience of it is that it's kind of like being tied up, you know, with mostly like just tied up on one side of your body and asked to go and do jumping jacks and, and just like, it's, not able to do all the things and and mentally you feel sharper like you you know i had for the most part <laughs> i've maintained my sense of self and personality but uh but it's just insane amount of confusion and frustration what is the you know when, when you get diagnosed with something multiple sclerosis and and you know I, I, you know, certainly I, as even, even as a physician, I, I couldn't tell you all the things that are, that are involved in that. And I haven't read extensively on the literature on that. I mean, I know people with it and I know we're, we're actually able to been able to help some people fortunately with that, but what, you know, what were you told as far as prognosis? What were the treatments that were being offered to you at that time? Um, I was died. I, I was, uh, prescribed. Uh, a couple of different medications that were, you know, just trial medications that didn't, you know, did not work, gave me horrible reactions. And, uh, you know, because they were, you know, daily injections and then the injection sites would get swollen and infected and like, it was just a mess. And then I got onto another one, which is, you know, going and diverting all of your lymphocytes, your, your white blood cells to, uh, uh, to, to your Goodness, man, it's been a while since I since I've talked about that uh, to the lymph nodes. So it goes and keeps all of that there, and so it keeps it from attacking your brain, but it also makes you really susceptible to all sort of, uh, you know, if anybody had a, a flu or a cough or anything like that, I would I would get that, and you know, if it takes people like three to five days to get over the, you know, the, you know, the cough or the cold or the flu or whatever, it would take me weeks. And I was just down for the camp. I mean, man flu to the nth degree. Yeah. So you're, you're taking a, a medication that suppresses your immune system because multiple sclerosis is quote unquote, an autoimmune type disease. So the body starts attacking itself. And so when, Ever we put people on these medications to suppress their immune system, well, guess what? They become more susceptible to infections and other things our immune system, cancers and things like that are other, thing, other things that our immune system, system is usually surveilling against. And so, um, and then sometimes uh, corticosteroids are used. I don't know, if, did you get put on those as well? Yeah, uh, yeah. whenever I had a massive flare up or an attack, I would be given uh, a corticosteroid to just make things simmer down. But then that had some effects. So you went from, you know, at 26 before you were diagnosed, I guess, normal, normally functioning guy, able to do the complex juggling stuff to mm -hmm. where did you go? I mean, what, what sort of things did you lose? What, 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 what happened to you physically? I went from being able to juggle and you know, travel around the world or around the, the country, at least, with the Renaissance festivals and teaching that and performing that, to uh, not being able to tie my shoes, not being able to button a shirt, not being able to, you know, have even uh, expressions because I had, you know, kind of a, a T, uh, what is it, a TMI, you know, a soft stroke. TIA. And so I got... Yeah. Uh, TIA, yeah, uh, transient ischemic attack, they say. And so I got really weak on my left side, and I'm still weaker on my left side than I am on my right. And But I'm able to work out now, and I'm slowly evening that out. Yeah, so, you know, as you – I know you said you at some point you were even limited on how much you could walk, right, at some point? 
Oh yeah. I was, when I first got diagnosed, when I had my first attack and then at several other attacks, you know, cause I've had it for, uh, what, 11 years now. Um, and you know, at several different times I've gotten to a point where I was inflamed enough or having enough of an attack or an exacerbation that I was not able to walk. And I've had to be on in a scooter, um, or a wheelchair. And, you know, like, like if I go to a big Walmart or a Costco, I have to take the electric scooters. And, you know, I'm a fairly young man and, and I'm just having to scoot along on the electric scooter and have the beep, beep, beep whenever I back up and yeah. all that. Yeah. So, you know, I was on crutches using a cane, you know, everywhere in between. Okay. And then, so, you know, as and you had a neurologist, I'm sure you're working with, uh, and they're prescribing the medications and you're declining apparently, I mean, obviously it got worse. And so what, 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 what were they continuing to tell you? Was it just, just to take the medicines or how did they approach that? Yeah. So the most recent medication that I was on was called a, it's Tysabri, which is a, a tingle, Natalizumab. There yes. we go. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Another, another immune drug, right? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. It's, it, it's actually a, a type of a uh, monoclonal antibody, mm -hmm. but it, but it does have the effect of being a, uh, an immunosuppressant. And so I was working well with that, you know, better than I had before, but still having issues with if I got, if it got too bright, if I was in the heat, if I got fatigued, I would have to be going back to using like a wheelie walker, a rollator, or, you know, even being in a wheelchair again. So, yeah. Yeah. And so that, that limits your ability to function. You know, I mean, you, it's hard to be able to carry a job or, you know, I'm sure relationship wise, it's difficult. To, it's challenging. Um, so how did you, I mean, obviously you're now here in this Rivero community and you're, well, I'll let you tell your story about that. But how did you decide that I'm going to do something outside of medicine? What my doctor's telling me to, to and what, what what prompted you to do that? I found a lady up in Canada. I think she's in BC uh, by the name of Pam Bartha, and you know she's got the the Live Disease Free protocol, and she referenced the Dr. Uh, Alan McDonald, who did uh, biopsies on the brain and spinal tissue of, uh, you know, of brains and, you know, central nervous system of uh, MS patients from the, uh, the Denver brain bank, bang, bang, uh, brain bank. And, uh, and he went and he, cause he was looking for Lyme disease because so many people thought that, oh, MS is just Lyme. And, you know, because people would go on an, uh, a Lyme protocol to get rid of the Lyme in the Borrelia bacterium. And they would feel better, but then they would get that again, you know, once they stopped that and just, you know, came back with a vengeance. And Dr. McDonald found that uh, 10 out of 10 MS patients have uh, nematodes in the brain and, and spinal cord. And so went on a whole protocol of going and getting rid, you know, um, getting rid of the uh, of the parasites and the Borrelia because Borrelia bacteria is uh, symbiotic with the nematodes. So it's just nematodes are going through your brain and they're pooping, you know, Lyme disease all over your system kind of thing. It's, it's like really nasty, but, but so I went on a, I followed that for uh, hard on a three months of that eating plan of Pam Bartha, which is a keto diet. But it's, you know, with, you know, a big freaking salad every day and, you know, lots of green leafy vegetables. And so I was feeling better because I was starving. I wasn't eating a bunch of carbs, you know, keyword a bunch. Um, but I found that every time I had a big salad, I would get joint pain and I had more of my symptoms would just kind of linger. And then and then I went you know, then I found you and Dr. Barry and, uh, and different folks and said, oh, hey, they're just cutting out all the carbs. So 
hmm, curious. And then I went and uh, cut out all the carbs and did a, a four day dry fast. Um, and when I came out of that, I didn't have to use my cane anymore. I didn't have to use a, a, the scooters at Walmart or Sam's Club or Costco. I could go on tours and walk around the neighborhood without my cane. Did you ever look into, because, you know, there's famously Dr. Terry Walls has a protocol for MS, which is uh, very vegetable rich. I mean, there's much of that in there. I mean, there's a little bit, I think there's some, some degree of meat in there. Um, was that ever part of the, what you looked at? Uh, that is what I, one of the things I looked at and I tried it for a short period, but I, I had enough cognitive decline just being wrecked with the inflammation in my brain and, uh, and then all the scar tissue on my brain, it got to the point where I couldn't go and make a meal plan and make sure that I got all the different foods and, and all the ingredients to make all the different meals and just keep that consistently and keep doing my job because I was working as a, a, a remote life insurance agent. And so I had to keep track of all of that. And that was really where my focus went. Yeah. Yeah. So not only was it affecting your physical performance, it was actually impacting your cognitive uh, abilities with, with the plaques on the brain and the cere cerebrum and, that stuff. And you mentioned Borrelia burgdorferi for those people that aren't familiar. That's the, that's the, the agent that you get from Lyme or the Lyme disease causative back, you know, uh, bacteria, I suppose. Um, so you, you know, suddenly you change your diet, drop all carbs, I guess, basically a meat based diet, you notice significant improvement. Um, and then I think I remember you tell me, you know, you did well and then you declined again and something you changed something in the diet, perhaps, and then you fixed it to talk about that a little bit, if you don't mind. Yeah. So I, I, I was a little foolhardy when I first got onto the carnivore diet because it was so amazing. I could work out. I could walk out in the heat, in the bright light in Arizona, because I was living in Arizona at the time. And, uh, and so I was like, I'm doing well. I don't need to keep doing this uh, uh, disease-modifying drug, the Tysabri that I was on. And so I was like, it's like I'm cured. And so I stopped it cold turkey all of a sudden. And, and that has its own boomerang effect, which is horrible. And then, you know, and also I would cheat here and have a beer and cheat here and have some chocolate. And, you know, I wasn't fully hardcore on that. And I didn't keep up the uh, antiparasitic uh, treatments for getting rid of, you know, the friends in my body system. And, and so, you know, with, with, you know, so obviously not, not being, you know, I guess having cheats. And, and so you changed it. I think you went back to strict, you maybe want a higher fat percentage, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Cause I, uh, I spoke with Emily Penton and, uh, she, cause she also has, uh, uh, multiple sclerosis or had multiple sclerosis and bipolar and, uh, and I was like, Hey, you know, I, I just talked with her and asked her what she found was working for her. And she's asked me, you know, how much fat I was eating. And I'm like, well, I'm eating nothing but meat. That's, that is such a huge ton of fat because, you know, for eight years I was vegan. Right. And on a insanely low fat diet. <clears throat> and then, and then she's like, no, 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 no. You, you need more fat. And here's different ways that you can go and get more fat in your diet. And then I started incorporating the more fat and, uh, on my, uh, most recent MRI, which was, uh, at the end of last year, you know, cause I, I showed him the, the MRIs for, that I've had in years previous. And he mentioned that um, I've regained, uh, you know, some of my cranial mass because I had lost over five and a half percent of my brain, you know, over the, the decade before. And, uh, and he said, you know, yeah, you've, you're regaining mass on your brain and you had some uh, 
uh, thoracic and cervical lesions that showed up on your previous uh, MRI that don't show up there now. I was like, that that that's not supposed to happen, you know, um, to just heal the the nerve tissue like that. And he's like, well, you know, sometimes people, you know, you can get uh, spontaneous remission and just kind of brushed it off. Yeah. Uh, well, two interesting points. Are, one, I didn't realize you were vegan before. I don't know. So you did veganism for eight years, and then what, was it at the time of diagnosis you left that, or what caused you to stop being vegan? Well, okay, so. Uh, Let's see if I can just sum this up. So in junior college, I got all uh, emotional because I was a the family butcher for rabbits when I was a kid. And so in my early teens, I was butchering rabbits and chickens and the occasional turkey. And then and so that kind of got me all boogered up. And and then I saw about vegetarianism. I was like, oh, hey, vegetarianism, like that's a karmically clean way of eating. So in junior college, um, when I was working on my associates, I had a vegetarian trash panda diet. So it's a lot of refined carbs. And it's like, oh, hey, uh, let's see, uh, Oreos are vegan, uh, ramen noodles are vegan, and uh, yeah, Pop-Tarts are vegan. Hey, perfect, man, I, I, I can so do this and I don't have to break the bank because I'm going to college. And so I did that. And, uh, and then, uh, and then come around where I'm 27 and I already dropped out of university because I was like, man, there's just a hole with no bottom getting into student loan debt. Um, and then after, you know, while on my honeymoon and then getting diagnosed with that big first attack, um, my wife did research and said, oh, hey, people that go to a plant-based whole food diet have uh, better outcomes with it, with MS. And I was like, okay, well, I'm not, I, I can't tie my shoes and and you won't allow me near uh, a, a, an open range, you know, to cook anything. So it's like, if, if you're going to cook this, I, I will eat what you're cooking because I don't have a lot of choices. It's eat your food or starve. <laughs> And so she went all vegan and, uh, and, and along with her, I, and then I felt better for a month because, you know, coming off of a trash panda diet to mm -hmm. vegan, well, that's, it's kind of a step up, but I had the first getting better and then it just went up and down, but trended downwards for the, the next eight years. Okay. Okay. And, and so, um, going to from vegan to, to to meat based fully carnivore uh i don't and i don't know is your spouse still with you kevin or do you you guys still together she is not okay so so you're you're so how are you cooking now i mean how are you are you making your meals yourself i know you said your parents were helping you a little bit what's what's going on with that now yeah, yeah they will help so like my dad knows how to use his grill and so he will if he's grilling he loves grilling he's like very protective of the grill but if it if I'm cooking just hamburger meat, or if I'm you know cooking a steak in a, a cast iron skillet on the stove and in the oven, doing a reverse here, like I'll do all of that myself. So the majority of what I eat is what I'm cooking. Yeah, I want to just I want to I want to emphasize a point that you've had objective MRI evidence of the disease going away, which I think is really really interesting, and the fact that. You know, a lot of physicians say, well, you know, some people goes away and, and, and they don't follow up on that and say, hey, what the hell are you doing? I mean, this is this could be useful for my other patients, perhaps. We don't seem to see that for some odd reason. So when I mean, I know you said you, you're planning on having another MRI in the near future. Is that is that occurred yet or what's what's new? On yeah, that? I went I, I went and had my uh, six month follow up with my neurologist just uh, two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And he said that he's setting in an order for getting another MRI with contrast of the, the head, neck and thoracic spine again, just to see how things are going, because I am back on that uh, uh, immunomodulating mm -hmm. uh, treatment, the Tysabri. And uh, and he's being really particular and insistent. It's like, OK. And, and he said that based on how this MRI goes, 
he will talk about, and, you know, we can just discuss going and tit trading off instead of going whole hog, just right, right. cold turkey. Yeah. And that's probably, you know, like I said, it, wise to tight trade off if, if you're able to, you know, mm -hmm. what, I mean, functionally, I mean, compare it contrast to your, so at your worst, you're on a vegan diet, wheelchair bound, uh, you know, can't tie your shoes, can't really do much to what, what have you been able to regain? Where are you at today? You know, compared to where you were then. So I tied my shoes this morning. Good. Um, I tend to wear a Utella kilt, so I don't have to like button my pants. So that's not an issue, but the times that I do wear pants, I can button the pants again. Um, I am relearning how to juggle and do the, the contact juggling, which is the form that I had as my passion. Um, and I'm, I'm learning all of that again. And emotionally, I'm a lot more level. And I can walk around in the yard. I can go and, you know, I can go to school and college and work on another career path. And uh, all of that type of stuff. Yeah, I don't want to ignore. I mean, you know, the MS is is something that's so remarkable. But I mean, the, the things like bipolar disorder, and we've seen like folks like Amber O'Hearn, who you know is fairly uh, fairly popular within the carnivore community. She famously re basically re re reversed her bipolar disorder basically by going on a on a meat based diet, and has written extensively about that. And is quite uh, a person that I always look up to as a as a source of information and knowledge and she's very very logical about this stuff so that is also uh really cool so the juggling and i, I gotta laugh about the utilica because I, I used to do the highland games and i used to walk you know wear my kilt around mm -hmm. and i remember seeing the utila kilts that people were utilizing and so it's a pretty convenient it is a convenient way to to to, to dress i suppose although maybe not in the winter time uh depending on where you live in the world but uh so how uh like what is contact juggling? I don't know. I, don't, I didn't know there were different. I'm, I'm, obviously, there's probably different types, but I'm not aware of any of them. Did you ever see the movie The Labyrinth with David Bowie? I think I did, but I don't know that I remember a juggling part. <laughs> okay, so so the David Bowie's character went and at the beginning of the film, when he's going and seducing uh, Sarah to come to his goblin kingdom. Uh, he went and did this little thing with a crystal ball where he just waved it back and forth and it looked like it was floating on his hand. And contact juggling is that essentially, but it's uh, not just on the hands, but going up around the arms, wrapping around the head, you know, going from side to side on the head, all of that. But uh, Okay, so you have like a ball that just kind of spins around your body, basically, or something. Yeah, or and also getting a collection of balls of like uh, two, three, four, five, six balls in the palms, and then just going and spinning them in different uh, complex formations. Interesting. Well, that's pretty cool. And so you're so how is that going for you? It's going well. It's emotionally, I am. I am feeling the joy of learning the juggling and with juggling. When I was teaching juggling, the first lesson is, you know, put the ball in your hand, turn your hand over boom, and it hits the ground. And you're like, get used to that. You're going to do it a lot because this isn't juggling. This is uh, dropping with style, you know, just go all buzz light. You're on you. But, uh, but so like, I'm developing and, and recovering the ability to do those things. And it is different just because I've not been able to use these neural pathways and these motions and you know, sequences of motions in any coordinated fashion for so many years. So it is progressing, progressing slowly, but I am in such a better headspace even than when I was first learning. Yeah, that's awesome. How to do that. That's awesome. Let me let me go back to your diet a little bit, Kevin, because there's people that you know, maybe a few people watching this that have MS, and you're like, "What are you eating? I mean, what are you what are you eating? How much fat are you eating? What's your protein? Eating? Are you eating fruits and vegetables? Are you adding those things in there?" Some people say you got to have fruit. I don't personally, but what do you, what are you doing? So I am eating almost 100 percent meat. Mm -hmm. The exception is like here in East Texas, we've got dewberries, the blackberries. And they're, they're just wild. And 
you know, my friends have a big dewberry patch by their house. And so they have a bowl of dewberries whenever I go over because we do a D and D role playing game. And when I stop over there and I see that, I will pick up one and I will enjoy one berry. And, you know, not having sugar or any carbohydrates for over a year now. I, I celebrated my carniversary uh, just a couple of weeks ago on the on the 26th of of May. And not having any of that, it's just eliminated my craving. So it's 100% uh, meat, mostly beef. Um, if I can get bison, I'll have bison as well, but then I have to add more fat. So I will go to the local uh, grocery store and in the morning, just go and buy uh, uh, beef cuttings. And it'll just be the, the fat trimmings off of the, the beef. And then I slice them up and I put them in bags and in the freezer. And then I have just bits of raw fat that I will just nosh on to go and keep my fat high. Uh, or I will do what uh, Coach Becky Niles has is a uh, whipped tallow sticks where you take an egg beater and uh, capella flavor drops, which don't have any carbohydrates or really anything except concentrated flavor. And then just whip up uh, some uh, some tallow off of the uh you know of the fat that i render yeah so uh, so if you had to estimate you know percentage of your diet's coming from fat 80 percent, or where, where are you at on that you think i would say about our and, and now with the whole talking about the macros are we discussing weight or calories well i think calories if, if you know either way but i mean i usually okay. stick of things in, in terms of calories typically okay yeah so so the concept of calories i'm doing about 80 85 percent that yeah okay and that's 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 similar to what the people people that advocate something like a pkd protocol they're they're somewhere in that neighborhood you know it's like two to one fat to protein or something like that by gram um and then so how much are you eating a day? How much, how much do you weigh and how much do you eat a day? I am six foot four. Wow. I weigh 165 pounds. Okay. And I eat about two pounds of meat a day. Okay. So you're not, you're not starving by any means. That's, that's certainly, it's actually a pretty decent amount of food for a, for a 165 pound guy. Now you're almost as tall as I am. I, I've got about, sounds like about 80, 85 pounds on you or something like that. But, uh, and I honestly, I maybe I'll eat three, three and a half. So it's it's probably about appropriate. So by no means starving. Um, are you are you only eating grass fed meat? Are you including organs in your in your in your in your uh, diet? I, I'm not eating only grass fed, mm -hmm. but uh, if I can get it and afford it, I will do that. But if not, I will just eat whatever meat that is available and handy. Yeah. And, and um, did, as far as organs, yeah, I will. Um, I generally don't, I've tried liver several times and just had really ugh, visceral response to yeah. the, the liver heart. I love heart, yeah. except I need to add fat to it because it's very lean, yeah. but we do have some family friends that raise Scottish Highland cattle. Mm -hmm. And, and then whenever they have cattle butchered, I will request, um, about two to three pounds of liver off of them and, and the heart. And then they will go and, you know, just ship that or uh, package that for me. And that is the only beef liver that I actually enjoy the flavor of. And that is 100% grass fed. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've had some of the Highland, Highland cattle as well. Uh, years past quite good. Um, and heart is very much similar to just regular steak kind of, it's very similar mm -hmm. it's a smooth muscle, you know, type of, type of thing there. Um, so what about, uh, other things you're doing outside of diet? I know you're on, you're on that immune modulating drug still, which you may be tied titrating off, um, sleep, exercise, light exposure, any of those things play a role in, in your recovery. So I have to be really particular on my sleep mm -hmm. because if I don't sleep well, it's like life is horrible kind of thing. If I do sleep well. I'm just doing the best ever, right? Um, I also do grounding, you know, once or twice a day, at least. Um, I got some grounding shoes. I'll go barefoot if the terrain that I'm at is 
you know, amenable to that. Um, and then I also uh, will do uh, the antiparasitic stuff as well to continue doing that. And I'm still continuing to move those things out of my system. And every time I do, uh, I feel better. Interesting. What is the what, what is the antiparasitic that you're that you're utilizing? Um, so it is using a power, uh, a powerful but gentle oxidizing agent, which um, I'll let you know about later. But uh, and then doing um, enemas about three times a week of just going and washing out the detritus in the colon. Mm -hmm. And I always thought like, well, I'm thin, and if I'm doing enemas, that's that can't be good because I'm you know I'm not going to get the nutrition. And then researched it a little more and well it's the small intestine is where you know 90 95 percent of the food is right. actually absorbed into right. the body right. yeah you're not you're not absorbing much from your colon you get a little bit of, of, of mineral and electrolytes and uh uh water and fluid i mean i guess if you're if you're eating a lot of plants you may be absorbing some amount of the short chain fatty acids that are being fermented in there but it is not a Humans aren't really set up well to design to to absorb a lot of food from the from the colon. It's, if it's not done by the small intestine, you're not getting much much more out of that. So interesting. Um, and then as far as uh, you said, you're going back to you're going to the gym. You're getting stronger, or what's what's going on with that? Not going to the gym. Um, I'm I've got a little home gym set up because I'm just in like one bedroom with uh, my you know attached bathroom and. So I go and have uh, a couple of sets of resistance bands. I've got a 35 pound dumbbell. I have a uh, 25 pound kettlebell, a 40 pound kettlebell and a 50 pound kettlebell. And so I'll go and work on that just to keep my heart rate up and, and then to have the resistance training. And then, uh, and then I do body weight training as well, just with getting through the push-ups. How does that, does that impact your MS in any way to make it better, make it worse acutely or chronically, or what are your thoughts on that? So like in the moment while I am exercising and, you know, cause that, you know, you get an inflammation response whenever you're exercising. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so that will kind of just hint at the old habits of the inflammatory, uh, you know, cascade that would happen and but i'm getting better at regulating my breath and regulating my internal state and being able to keep calm so yeah i get you know wore out whenever i work out because i'm you know you're not doing it right if you don't get worn out right and uh but then going about my daily life working out has been the crucial thing to maintaining my ability and you know going and just living life being able to go to the store being able to walk around and and like i'm not going to say oh i'm 100 percent cured and all that because if i get fatigued if i'm in uh in a an environment that's overly stimulating like if there's a bunch of kids screaming around me and like that just puts me mm, in, in that space and puts me on edge. Um, but in general, as long as I'm working out and continuing that and get sleep. Are you still making progress from what you can tell? Is it still, are you still going upwards as far as your progress? I too? am. Yeah. It's so, so when I was vegan and all of that, I was up and down, trending down, right? For years and years, um, better part of a decade. And now I am up and down, trending upwards. So like I have bad days, but my bad days are still better than the good days that I used to have. Yeah, that's interesting. And so, I mean, when you look at all the things you're doing, sleep, exercise, uh, and a parasitical stuff, the, 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 the monoclonal antibody, the diet, how would you rate those in relative importance to you, to your recovery? So the monoclonal antibodies I'm saying is a kind of like a band-aid, which is just hold me over while everything else gets done. 
because you know being on a vegan diet for eight years and a trash panda and you know nasty vegetarian diet you know for the five years before then um you know so for the better part of two decades i've been eating trash and there's a lot of damage that was done to my body and so i'm having to go and reverse a lot of that and i am if mri scans are to be believed um i am reversing that but it is a long process because i have years and years of trauma that i've done to my body and so i would say primarily the diet the diet and the the diet and the sleeping are just in the everyday thing i don't plan on having to do the antiparasitic treatment for the rest of my life i'm going to continue doing it for the next 18 months or so but you know once i'm done i'll just you know I'll do, I'll do like our our grandparents and great grandparents. It's like, oh, once or twice a year, I'll go and get dewormed, right? You know, because you know, I talk to my mother, and and she talks about her grand her her mother, my grandma. You know, when you know, twice a year in the spring and in the fall, it was you know, my mom and my uncle like would have to take this medication, and my, they didn't know what it was, and it was just you know, to go and get the worms out, right? Hmm. And then during the rest of the day, uh, the year, if they just got in an ordinary mood and were like, ah, rah, 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 you know, rapping about stuff and uh, talking back and all that, it was like, oh, need to go and do a worm and, and and that would level them out and their whole emotions would be a lot more chill. And yeah. Well, so, I mean, so I'll continue that maintenance. Yeah, interesting. And I, I wonder, you know, what they were eating, uh, that they were being exposed to parasites like that. You know, it, it's just, uh, I'm not sure. You know, were they eating a lot of wild game and stuff like that, you know? Um, not a lot of wild game. Um, like, they, they had meat and they had vegetables and all that. But as far as, you know, because I've been looking into this, as far as I can tell, uh, parasites are just rather endemic in the world we live in. And a lot of people say, oh, but this is a first world country. We don't have parasites. But, you know, we've all got parasites. I mean, if you saw, watch Bart K had this lady on, you know, a month or two ago that was discussing the parasites thing. And um, and it's just like, yeah, it, it doesn't matter if you're living clean and all that most people have parasites those that don't eat carbohydrates aren't feeding the parasites and making it such a a helpful situation for the parasites to stay interesting i i know when i was in afghanistan we took care of a lot of the locals and they we had to give them you know uh, different medications i think we gave them ivermectin if i'm not mistaken uh, and, and we would see a lot of worms uh, that would come out of their big ones, big worms, big giant worms in their digestive tracts. And so, again, uh, interesting. Kevin, um, what are your goals for the next uh, couple of years? I mean, you're going back to school. What do you plan on, you know, obviously getting a second lease on life, I guess, you know, and what do you plan on doing with that? So, so if we want to talk about the next couple of years, it's going to be uh, working as a certified medical assistant and that's just working in the doctor's office and uh, and then transitioning to a virtual medical assistant where I'm, you know, setting up appointments, you know, uh, filing the insurance and all of that kind of stuff. But that's just the holdover, the, the Band-Aid, really, until, um, to you know, to keep me financially stable enough. Because my in five years, five to ten years, um, my, my big goal is to be taking my a hypnotherapy practice and holding hypnotherapy retreats in Guatemala. Interesting. Well, that's pretty interesting, Kip. Let me ask you one last question. Um, your physician, you know, said, hey, spontaneous remission, we're going to check it. D did you talk to him about diet or any of this stuff at all? Or does he care? Uh, or what's the thought? He knows my diet because, you know, I've, I've been upfront and just like from the beginning told him like, hey, I'm on a carnivore diet, eating high fat. And he's like, Okay. Yeah. You know, it's like didn't have anything to say about it. He wasn't mm -hmm. poo-pooing it and he wasn't yeah. singing its praises. 
Got it. Okay. So probably doesn't, not much interest in nutrition. Well, anyway, Kevin, thank you for sharing your story. It's been fascinating. All the different facts, the things I didn't know you were up to. And didn't, I didn't know about the juggling and some of this stuff. So it's pretty cool. Uh, I look forward to hearing the, the newest update on the new MRI and see how that goes. Hopefully we'll see continued progress. And certainly at the end of the day, seeing you just being able to function is, is totally awesome. So thank you very much. I know you have, I know you have some Instagram, I think. Can you share that with people that may want to follow your journey? Yeah. My, my Instagram is scholarly carnivore. Scholarly, like the smart guy. Okay. Got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Got it. Awesome. Anything else you get, you have to share for anybody, anybody else that wants to find you? Um, so uh, scholarly carnivore at gmail.com. And I'm currently working on my link tree so that you can go to Linktree slash scholarly carnivore, and then that will have links to my Instagram, my uh, Facebook, my whatever. But I'm still working on that. Perfect. All right, guys. Well, I'm going to shut this one down right now. Thank you, Kevin. I'm sure we'll see you in another meeting very soon. Uh, for the rest of you guys, we'll see you guys back tomorrow. You guys have a great day. Thanks again, Kevin. You guys take care. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you, Sean.